So what the big theta allows us to do is basically write complicated functions in a much simpler way. So we can take a function like 1 over 2 times n squared and just think of it as big theta of n squared. 8 times root n we can think of as just root n, big theta of root n. Our equation from before, 2n minus 2 times the square root of n, just becomes big theta of n. It's just a linear function asymptotically. A complicated expression like this, where we have n4, which is the term that grows the fastest, becomes big theta of n. The natural log of n, in fact, the, any base log of n, is big theta of, well, any other base log of n, as long as it's a constant. I like to think in terms of base 2 logs, because I'm a computer scientist. That's what we do. Pi squared is something that doesn't grow with n, and it ends up being in the set big theta of 1. It's just another constant. So just to beat this dead horse a little bit longer, let's use the definition of big theta to show that this expression that we determined for the growth in edges in a grid, 2n minus 2 times the square root of n, really is just a linear function. It grows like big theta of n. All right, so the game plan is that we need to find constant c1 and c2 bigger than 0, and a threshold n0, so that for all the n bigger than n0, the function that we care about is sandwiched between these two scalings. So let's focus on this one first. What c2 can we plug in here so that we're guaranteed that this will be above this expression? So if we just copy this inequality down, just flipping it around, make it a little easier to think about, we want a c2 so that c2 times n is bigger than this. Divide through by n. So now we need a c2 that is bigger than 2 minus something that's actually growing. 2 should work for that. So if we set c2 to 2, it will satisfy this inequality. So let's just summarize all that. We can set c2 equal to 2. What about c1? Well, let's take c1 to be 1. Intuitively, the idea being this function is growing like 2n minus something smaller than that. So n should be underneath of that. But let's just make sure. If c1 is equal to 1, then we need n to be less than or equal to this expression. For what values of n is that going to be true? It's not true of all of them, but it's true of some of them. We can add 2 root n to both sides and subtract n from both sides. We get that. If we divide through by root n, we get 2 less than or equal to n divided by root n. n divided by root n is actually root n. So we have 2 less than or equal to root n. If we square both sides, we have 4 less than or equal to n. Or, flipping that around the other way, if n is bigger than or equal to 4, then this is true. That means we have to throw away the smaller values of n. And we can do that very simply by setting n0 to 4 because this only has to hold for n that are bigger than n0, and that's what we've got there. So there we have it. If we set the constants this way, n0, c1, and c2, then what we find is that for big enough n, this more complicated expression is sandwiched between two simple linear functions. Or, to say it another way, 